Hi, this is Dr. Steven Seiler. I am speaking to you from Norway where it's still winter right now, but spring is coming. And on April 2nd, we'll be doing a new webinar with my friends down in Australia, Pogo Physio and Brad Beer and his team. The title of this webinar will be Durability and High Intensity Repeatability in Endurance Training. And it'll be a three hour event with sessions on understanding the big picture for long-term development and then discussing how to program and execute the long, low intensity sessions, how long, how, what intensity. Then we'll discuss high intensity training, how to, whether to intensify or extend those interval sessions and why. Then we'll discuss the training monitoring process to make sure that the training is sustainable and the balance between work and rest is being achieved. And then we'll We'll open it all up for questions so that you can uh, make sure that you come away with an understanding of what I'm trying to, to get across. So join me on April 2nd. I think it's going to be uh, a good Saturday. Looking forward to speaking with you. That's right. We are just over one week away from Dr. Stephen Siler's 2022 live stream event, Durability and High Intensity Repeatability in Endurance Training. If you were part of 2020's popular live stream, Sustainable Training for Attainable Endurance Goals, then you know that this is not a learning opportunity you want to pass on. There is still time to register. Jump over to physicalperformanceshow.com and secure your tickets for the Dr. Stephen Siler 2nd of April live stream event, Durability and High Intensity Repeatability in Endurance Training. And it's Dr. Stephen Siler who you will enjoy today on this expert edition of the podcast, introducing this term of durability to us. What does it mean exactly? How do you define it? Why is it that we know it when we see it? And what are the training methods we can use to induce adaptations towards it? I think that's important to to just help people see that it's not just me. You know, a lot of people just think, oh, it's only me that struggles and the elite athletes, they don't have all this. Well, that's not true. They all, We all have lives and we all have our stuff. So I think that in itself is a learning. It's a lesson that helps people bring their shoulders down and kind of say, okay, well, you know, we all deal with this stuff and it's okay to drop a workout or whatever when I need to that's not going to make me a worse athlete. It may make me a better athlete. So that, these are things that I think are just at least as important as percent of heart rate max or lactate or whatever is, is just kind of coming to grips with the reality of fitting it into your life, you know, and, and giving yourself a break. And the is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. <laughs> Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Polar's world-leading GPS watches and heart rate monitors. I'm Brad Beer, sports and exercise physiotherapist and founder of Pogo. Each week, as you know, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. Of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, interest editions, coaches' corners, learnings catch episodes, feature performers, and expert editions. And off the back of Professor Eric Hegedus's sharings last week around return to run programming, get ready as always for a fun, entertaining, but of course educational conversation with Dr. Stephen Seiler, acclaimed world sports scientist and forefather of polarized training. So get your pen and paper ready. Here is Dr. Stephen Seiler introducing us to the terms durability and high intensity repeatability. Dr. Stephen Seiler, it's 2022, and it wouldn't be a new calendar year without inviting you back 
as an expert edition guest of the Physical Performance Show. So welcome back. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be back. Always with our usual time zone differences and so forth. <laughs> Dr. Sila, we uh, featured you back on 2020 for a hugely popular live stream, Sustainable Training for Attainable Endurance Goals, which at the time was attended by people within the endurance sporting community worldwide, coaches, practitioners, athletes. Uh, and in 2022, uh, you are back with a new live stream event, which we're very excited about. And, uh, and that is all about this concept of durability and high intensity repeatability. So with this, I guess, headline episode leading into the live stream, it'd be great to explore a few of those uh, a little bit more about that topic. Yeah, and, and, and I should say, it's not like we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. The, the basics of the training process that I talked about in the last live stream, they, of course, are still relevant, but we're trying, we're constantly trying to, you know, get better and, and refine the process and, and, and look into it more in more detail. And, and as I learn and our field learns, then, then we try to, you know, keep that discussion uh moving forward so that's what we'll try to do in the live stream and and in that regard uh i think the classic model of training is being challenged a bit in this or extended let's call it extended because we're saying hey it's not just uh what you can measure with the vo2 max and the threshold and the efficiency lab tests that we've done for decades that we're, we see that athletes, there's something about duration, about their their ability to just maintain their function, their physiological capacity longer, and then also their ability to, 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 to do those tough, high-intensity bouts of exercise later in a race. Uh, and that's a development that keeps happening perhaps over years, even after VO2 max has peaked out and threshold power has peaked out and so forth. So this is what we're trying to get to understand. And then also to try to uh, help uh, athletes think about, well, how do I train this? Is it fair to say, Dr. Siler, the likes of Elliot Kipchoge or Paula Radcliffe, who it's well reported, uh, say for Paula's case, hit a higher VO2 max earlier in their career than the world record marathon at the time. But this concept of durability over developed over years could be one of the factors that explains, for example, a Paula Radcliffe marathon PB after her VO2 max was on the decline. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure how much it declined, but it certainly plateaued uh, much earlier in her career than her peak performance. And of course, the case study uh, that, that has been published by Andrew Jones kind of goes through that of the different time sequences. And and I wrote about this, uh, it's like two decades ago, that says there was basically these different time frames for VO2 max. That happens really early. We, we hit peak or VO2 max quite early in the training career of an endurance athlete. Uh, and then the threshold, you know, or FTP or however you want to, you know, there's different ways of describing it, maximum lactate steady state, that kind of, that adaptive set of, of things seems to happen a bit later. And then the last or another issue is efficiency, you know, or economy, just, just, you know, putting in the kilometers on the road or on the bike and optimizing your ability to generate a certain watts or a certain pace with the lowest possible energy expenditure. So that's, and, and these seem to happen with different sequencing and and then I guess of what we're starting to see in in there, it's related to efficiency, but is that this issue of of being able to extend the to go longer without deteriorating, and and there is I think it's really important for all exercisers and athletes to understand there's there really is no such thing as a, as a steady state, a, a physiological steady state. It's all quasi in the sense that. If you go long enough at even that low intensity talking pace, you deteriorate both due to energy availability, your glycogen de depletion, also just mechanical damage to muscle fibers, uh, maybe some neurological changes, oxidative stress, the so-called free radical. So there's, there are just deterioration processes that are happening in the body that make themselves 
visible or, or relevant as things start to stretch, as the hours increase. Uh, and what we seem to see is that those athletes that have done a lot of low intensity training, just they get more durable. They, which is to say, uh, an example of increased durability would be uh, that they do not show the heart rate drift as much, or it, it's delayed. They don't, you don't see that, that so-called uncoupling between heart rate and pace power as early or as, uh, as significantly. Uh, I saw, that was one of the first things I saw with myself when I started training again, is that, you know, I started, you know, the first few months I get kind of up to a decent, uh, intensity, but then over the, s s s the next six months, what happens is, is I, I am getting more durable and my heart rate was not inflecting and going up after 90 minutes as much. It was staying flatter. And so a three hour ride was just more, what should I say? More comfortable for me. Uh, those last, the last hour was not, didn't feel as stressful. And so I think th is this, but this takes time, this, and, and it takes patience and it takes doing those uh, more extensive workouts. You know, we always talk about intensity, but we need to also think about, <laughs> I'm making up a word here, extensity. <laughs> you know, the, you know, if you, what's your extensity, what, what is your ability to, to stretch and to, to, to last longer at that low intensity comfortably and in a, in being a, in a homeostasis and a rhythm and a flow without you, you know, because we've all experienced that, that, that low intensity session start that feels good. Initially it, you reach a point where it doesn't feel good anymore. It, it hurt. It, it's, it doesn't hurt in the same way that a high intensity session does, but you just, you go empty and you can't seem to mobilize you you just the body is just not responding to the call of duty in the same way and and so maybe that's a new word for the day is you know what's your extensity <laughs> what's the <laughs> <laughs> i can see that on a t-shirt with a dr stephen solar face on it uh what's your extensity but uh i mean it's sticky it, it, it's catchy it makes sense we talk about intensity everyone can get a uh a gauge on that but what's the extensity uh and I guess, uh, Dr. Siler, yourself and your colleagues, Ed Maunder, uh, Matthew Millendhall, Andrew Kildin, and uh, our friend of the show, Dan Plews, uh, out of New Zealand, your co-authors, po po put a paper out in uh, 2021 in April, uh, which I guess in some ways put durability on the map, the importance of durability in the physiological profile in endurance athletes. How has this paper been taken up uh, by the academic community? Well, it's interesting because it was a great collaboration. I was kind of already getting into this thought process. I was doing some data collections during the down, during the lockdown, you know, and so I was able to contribute data and they were already starting on an article looking at some testing aspects. And so everything just kind of came together and, and the paper has a number of different issues in it. But, but one of these issues is just kind of what I alluded to in that introduction was that uh, classic testing tells us quite a bit, but it doesn't capture this durability construct. It's not capturing this ability to, to last longer and so forth. So uh, I think it has had an impact. I, I know other people have been thinking the same term, but it, it's, you know, we just use the word durability and whether it's the perfect word, I'm not sure, but it, now I'm seeing that word uh, in some new publications. So, uh, and, and use in that construct. So I think we're all just kind of moving in that direction as we evolve in, in the sports science and, and we've helped a bit move it in that direction and other people are, are, are doing the same thing. The definition that uh, you give in the paper of this uh concept of durability uh, is defined as the time of onset and magnitude of deterioration in physiological profiling characteristics over time during prolonged exercise, which I guess uh, yeah. is, is summed up by what you shared earlier. Yeah. So, so that's, you know, and, and again, that's one of those things, as soon as you introduce a term, 
uh, like for polarized training or lactate threshold or whatever, you will then quickly get into heated discussions about what, well, yeah, what exactly do you mean? What's the definition? How do you measure it and everything? And so <laughs> this, I, you know, it's going to happen and we're going to get into the, the weeds uh, in the field. It's all right. What do you, what, what is durability? What, what do we really, how do we define it, measure it and so forth. But I, again, just to try to not go, not go down that path. I'd say, well, we know, we know what it looks like when we see it, you know, it, it, we can, we can fine tune about the details, but let's, let's not let that argument get in the way of a good understanding of saying, well, yeah, but this, the main issue is, is something that we can get our head around. You don't need a PhD in exercise physiology to understand the idea of durability right you know it as an athlete if you've been in the game long enough you know that yeah man when i first started an hour run felt like a long run and now two hours feels like a long run you know and an hour feels great so so that this is durability this is extending right uh the cyclist experience the same thing so in the triathlon triathlete of course so Durability is something we inherently understand. It's just that it hasn't, we haven't talked so much from a physiological point of view because we just don't usually put people in the lab and have them exercise that long. Yeah, most lab tests are not over hours, are they? They are over, you know, threshold tests, et cetera. They're fresh. Yeah, you bring them in fresh <laughs> and they leave in an hour, you know? And, and, it's, and it's partly, uh, let's be honest, it's partly business. Uh, just like at a fitness center is that you're on the clock and, <laughs> and if I'm going to do multiple tests, if I'm an exercise test technician, if I'm the physiologist in the lab, I, I really don't have time to spend three hours on each, uh, each athlete. So I'm doing these fairly short tests. I'm getting, they're warming up somewhere else. They come in and they jump on the treadmill. So there's, ex, we've got to be expeditious. Well, that's good. We've, we've gotten a lot out of that, but Again, out in the real world, things are stretching over a longer period. And, you know, let's take the triathlon or let's take cycling. We know that the race is not won in the first 15 minutes. Now, you may lose it in the first 15 by something really going wrong, but you're not going to win it there. You're going to win it towards the end. And often the way you're winning it is not that you're going faster than the other guy, but they're, they're dropping off in speed you're deteriorating less than the competition. And, th and that's true in the 100 meter sprint, the 200, you know, it's true all, in very many situations in, in elite sport and in, in sport in general is when it looks like one athlete is somehow finding new reserves of speed and, and, and going away from the competition, what's really happening is that athlete is maintaining speed and the other athletes are falling out. They're fading. You with me? But, but it looks the opposite. Yeah. Absolutely. This is durability. You know, this is the, the athlete that holds speed. Now there's exceptions, but the athlete that holds speed when the others decline, it looks like they're accelerating. Or if we add on top of this idea of durability, if we add on this idea of high intensity repeatability, which is a close cousin <laughs> of durability, it is that ability to mobilize, to bring in that, that, three minutes of you know high power or whatever it takes to get over the top of the hill to create a gap, to come around the curve and accelerate, to create the gap late in a race when the legs are empty. That's that repeatability coming to bear that to mobilize. And we see this in the spring classics and cycling, you know, and, and so forth is the certain athletes. You just have this group of athletes that in the sixth hour of a race, they just have a much higher percentage of their true maximum ability still available. Whereas even at the highest levels in the pro peloton, 90% of those athletes have fallen back. They, you know, they were good for five hours, but not for six. So there is even at the highest levels of competition, there's, there's a filtering process that's not associated with their VO2 max or their 20 minute power. It's something that's happening long, farther out, right? This, this less, they have less deterioration in their physiology over the course of many hours.
And that's that takes time to develop, and it's partly just part of their talent. That was my next question. We can all we can all get better at it. Uh, we can get better at it. Great, great. And and every endurance athlete says, "Amen." That's uh, that sounds great, right? That's why we stay uh, stay at it year after year. And when we see this uh, in endurance sports, uh, athletes into their early forties and beyond still producing in many instances and some instances world-class performances is the term fatigue resistance which is often thrown around in endurance circles is that interchangeable Mm. with this concept of durability and high intensity repeatability or is it a subset of that yeah it's definitely there again they're related i would say fatigue resistance is a very omnibus term that can that is applicable in the first 30 seconds and all the way out to to 10 hours you know fatigue fatigue resistance at different stages and different mechanisms a, a, a a little bit depending on which intensity we're range we're in and so forth and whereas this durability high intensity repeatability we're just kind of zooming in on late stage you know these these things that are happening after hours not minutes does that make sense absolutely after the extensification yeah after (laughs) extensity you know when you're out in that extensity range you know (laughs) So, <laughs> I, I recall in the 2020 live stream, uh, Dr. Siler, you shared a great word that stuck, and that's you know, the, I know it's not your term, but it was uh, stochastic. These stochastic efforts, you know, eight-hour races, six-hour races, where it's on, it's off. And you need to be able to be yeah. on again at the end of the race. Oh, and I don't think I even knew what that word meant five <laughs> years ago or eight or ten. I'm not sure when I learned it, but it, but it, it's definitely a word I've had to ex- embrace in the last years because. When I look at race files from particularly cycling, but also triathlon and so forth now, uh, they they are highly variable. They are stochastic. And, and triathlon super popular, and, and we can even talk about that, is that because of television, because of the powers that be, uh, the race courses have changed to become more TV friendly. Uh, and what's the result of that? Well, the race courses have more turns. They have more little sharp, sp- spiky hills. They're compact. But when you when you create that kind of a course, whether it's in triathlon cycling part or in, in cross-country skiing or in cycling criteriums, you create a more stochastic power profile. You, or you you necessitate it. You can't you can't win with an even power profile in that setting. Even power works great when you're on a flat terrain for 40k. Then you then we know what the pacing looks like, and you try to pace quite evenly. But that won't win you a race when you've got 90 degree turns, you've got short hills, and so forth. You have to pace the topography. You have to accelerate, try to hold speed. You, you try to hold speed, which requires higher power. Because of all that, it changes racing. And then we have to think, well, okay, does it change training? Does the triathlete, the cyclist need some of that stimuli of this reverberation or this, you know, the, hitting these high powers? And when I say high powers, like I was just looking at the data from the Milan San Ramo which is the longest pro, you know, the one day race, it's right at 300 kilometers and it's, you know, Oh, it's six and a half hours plus for these guys, you know, and they're really fast and it's still six and a half hours of racing. And still in the last hour of that race, there are just multiple thousand watt spikes, you know, 800 watt, 900 watt, thousand watt, just boom, 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 trying to, you know, regaining a wheel, attacking, trying to stretch that rubber band, trying to break free. And so, you know, that's, it's pretty <laughs> amazing that they're still doing this, but that's, that's what it takes to win. And so um, it, it's important it, when you see these race files and you see the actual raw data, then you understand, uh, oh, wow, <laughs> they're not, they're a lot different than I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I can, I can get above a hundred, a thousand Watts, uh, you know, fresh and maybe 1300 at my peak, but after six hours, I, I can't do much of anything, you know, I accept sitting on the sofa. So, 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 so it's just a different, you know, it's a different ball game. 
You're listening to this expert edition with Dr. Stephen Seiler to intensify or extensify the concept of durability. Today's episode is lovingly brought to you by Polar's world-leading GPS, multi-sport and running watches and their heart rate monitors. Coming from the heart of the Nordics and with over 40 years of proven performance, Polar believe it all starts with heart. Their products simply give you the most accurate way to plan, train and recover. Their Precision Prime heart rate technology is the most accurate way to plan and track your activity and recovery 24-7, 365. Polar's Training Load Insights allows you to explore the limits of your body so you can find out if you are training just right to improve your performance and reduce injury. And with Nightly Recharge, you can truly understand and predict your recovery so that you can not only win the day, but also own the night. So if you feel like it's time to beat your best, jump across to Shop Polar, polar polar.com. Check out their all new range. Support for today's show also comes from Earshot's Bluetooth headphones. Lock on, train on and rock on with Earshot's. Earshot's have you covered for staying motivated while you train. Earshot's patented magnetic ear clip means you can push your limits without being distracted by annoying cords or earbuds that fall out. Listeners of the show can enjoy 10% off your purchase of Earshot's Bluetooth headphones by using the code PERFORMANCE, or one word capitals, over at www.earshot's.com. Dot com. That's earshots.com. For now, let's jump back with Dr. Stephen Seiler to intensify or extensify the concept of durability. You alluded to it there, Dr. Seiler, but what training methods induce it? Uh, clearly, it's not just about extensify or uh, extending the minutes of the session, but it's also about this ability to reproduce high intensity towards the end yeah and, and so and and i don't have the i don't have the <laughs> the answer there you know it's i think probably the professional cyclists have a better understanding of it than i do and and they over time figure out what works for them you know that includes doing high intensity work after three hours of steady state work you know you know they doing a, a block early and then going three hours and then doing a new hard block in a workout, you know, there's different things. So they're very specific in that. And and part of the adaptation is probably just a, a what shall we say, a, some mental issues of just learning how to mobilize. That's a small part of it. At least part of it is nutrition of eating, you know, no being able to fuel, and handle the fueling. Like when I was talking to Tim DeClerc uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, and he's, he's called El Tractor. He's the guy that sits on the front <laughs> of the Peloton, making sure that the brake doesn't get too far away. So he's holding 325, 340, 50 Watts for two hours, you know, or three <laughs> hours, even, you know, amazing, you know, hit, but he has a very specific role that he's good at and he talked about you know trying to get in enough carbohydrate every hour to keep that keep it going and how he you know he's got a sensitive stomach and sometimes he feels like he deteriorates his ability to keep bringing in the carbohydrate over the hours gets worse and particularly as the intensity goes up you know so this this extensive uh, extending and high intensity repeatability it's both physiological adaptations in the muscle it's it's brain learning things to do and it's nutritional adaptation you know stomach adaptations and figuring out which fuel sources work best for you so there's just it's a it's a lot it's a set of of adaptations and learning processes that have to happen uh, to really get everything we can out of our body later in these races if you do something for 10, 20, 30 minutes, a lot of this doesn't matter. You don't have to, you don't have to carbo load for a 30, a 20, 30 minute race. So there, it's just the longer things get, the more things you have to do right. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Wow. Well, the longer the duration, uh, the more things you have to do right. Uh, when you say the term durability, the physiotherapist in me thinks about durability, durability of tissues, the ability to yeah. Be, ro- be robust uh, physiologically, physically show up week in, week out for training sessions as you've shared and taught us so well in the past. It's not the 10 training sessions and it's definitely not the epic one session that makes champions. It's that mm. ability to show up season after season, hopefully uninterrupted by injury. 
that is a mm. we talk about it a lot in the physical therapy space but it's still an out there often intangible concept we know it when we see it the robust athlete uh and we know it when we see it right. the athlete that tends to run into uh, a sequelae of injury and i have to and i want to be careful here because it might be that someone will listen to me and say oh i guess i need to get out there and do the an ep, these epic seven hour workout to build my my durability and and i'm going to say to you whoa 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 slow down let's go there you may eventually get there seven hours may be part of your equation but i would rather say to you let's first focus on just being able to do lots of workouts and stay healthy just as you're saying, so that the first measure of robustness is going to be just tolerating a, a pretty high frequency of training. So let's start with frequency. Can you train every day and feel decent and, and recover between each workout? Are you managing that? Are you managing your intensity and your duration? You know, and that, that's part of coming back to this 80, 20 business is, is trying to find a, a sustainable pattern of, of extensive and intensive workouts and managing that and then increasing frequency. That's kind of step one for the, for the, mo the age grouper. They're going from three workouts a week to four to five, you know, and, and, and sustaining it and staying healthy. And then once we've gotten up to a certain frequency, that's starting to feel pretty good five, you know, maybe even six days a week that they can sustain, and, and work and stay healthy, then we say, okay, let's see what happens now. Can we lengthen some of those workouts without dropping the frequency? Does that make sense? Absolutely. It starts with frequency and uh, staying healthy and then start to uh, extend. Yeah. And then you say, okay, now I'm going to, now I'm going to extensify. Extens <laughs> you know, I'm going to extensify. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and then, you know, and then small increments in intensity, but that's kind of the third, that's the, the last thing we use is is little increments in intensity, but a lot of times what the the inclination will be is that's the first thing we go to yeah. in turn in our in our adaptation work box or, or toolbox is we say, I, I'm going to go harder now. I'm going to do more intervals. I'm going to push the intervals harder. And so I, I would say, let's flip that around. Let's get frequency up. Then let's get comfortable with longer duration. Then let's start adding in more intensity and it's not from steven siler that invented this it's it's what we see good athletes doing and and then we can understand why but 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 it's developing from the athletes that through trial and error of figuring these things out yeah wow well, powerful frequency duration uh intensity Dr. Silo, where do you think the research will go in this field, further exploring this concept of durability? Where would you like it to go? Well, I think tech, one of the things that's been it's happening is dry, that's driving developments is technology is, is allowing us to move things out of the lab so we can do a lot of good physiological measurements in the field. And that makes it possible to explore these, for example, these longer duration kinds of physiological changes out in the field where they happen instead of having to try to create quite artificial settings in a laboratory of doing something for three or four hours that's just almost cruel and in inhuman punishment you know to make people <laughs> sit on a on a you know run on a treadmill for, for three hours or or sit on a bike for five hours in a in a little room you know although i do some of that myself <laughs> but then i'm just i'm kind of wacky but I, I do it at home but but my point is is technology allows us to do move some stuff out into the field and that's changing it and then of course digital the whole you know the big data that we have available on the training process through these digital cal calendars digital you know whether it's trainer road training peaks uh, you know these different tools strava or whatever uh, that do allow some uh, interrogation of big sets of data to try to get ideas of what's happening and then looking at how you know in groups that train this way how are they responding and and then that can drive hypotheses so we get this kind of nice i hope a symbiotic play between field field data and lab and traditional lab so that's where i'm seeing things going whereas if we go back 25 years people like me it was just all in the lab 
that that's where we could do this stuff. We didn't have the tools to go outside the lab, but now we do, and now we can. And we just have to, as we don't need to, guys like me shouldn't be afraid of that. Or, you know, because a lot of times you feel like I'm losing control. Now they don't need me anymore. They don't, the athletes <laughs> don't want to come into the lab, you know? So what am I, oh, this is scary. And this is what we're going through in our field is because a lot of great athletes, they just say, I don't need the lab. I don't need to know my VO2 max you know, to be a great runner or a great cyclist. And they're right. You know, I mean, that's true. You don't have to know your VO2 max to run fast, but you need some, you do need some tools, some benchmarks, some calibration. It's, you know, and so we just have to find, you know, respect each other in those regards. Uh, Certainly your Norwegian counterparts uh, who have featured here on the the physical performance show in the past, Dr. Seiler, the likes of I'll have Alexander Boo working with, uh, obviously, Christian Blumenfeld, Olympic triathlon champion, Gustav Eden, and the like. Yeah. Uh, they've certainly, I guess, opened many, in, in this case, triathlete-loving fans to the idea of in-field testing, whether it's the VO2 master, the top of Sierra Nevada, or wherever they're uh, pulling data out of. So I guess that's an example of what you were just sharing is that hopefully symbiosis between uh, field testing and in the lab that they both have their place. Yeah. And I was just, I'm getting ready to give a, have a talk with this, uh, Swedish, uh, speed skater t- this afternoon, Niels van der Poel, two world records and two gold medals. And, but he trained very differently. And one of the things he said is, look, I just never, I'd never had my VO2 max tested. I didn't go into labs because it's too, it, it disturbs my training rhythm. I have all these travel days I have to do. It breaks, you know, and so that's one of the issues is it's better to do standardized workouts for a lot of athletes where they can, if they repeatedly do the same workout under the same conditions, they get a very good indication of where their fitness is, how their heart rate is responding and things like that. And they can do that out in the field and they don't lose training time. They don't you know, extra, they don't get the extra stress from travel days and all this stuff. So that's, you know, athletes are being economical with their stress resources. They're, they're managing their body and man, like uh, Von der Poel said this and every athlete I know will say it. They say, look, travel days are not rest days. Mm -hmm. Travel days are stressful, you know? And so you shouldn't think that when you're traveling and you're not training that that's a rest day. No, it's stress, you know, and so the, 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 again, this is, these are the learnings of, of people who do this for a living during the season with all these travel, you know, having to get from one world cup to world cup and so forth. So they are trying to manage that stress, just like the busy, you know, physical therapist or, or academic, it's a different, a bit different set of stress stressors, but it's the same issue is what can I cut out so that I, you know, get save some of my stress energy for where I need it most. And you shared around that in uh, 2020's live stream, that concept of uh, net stressors on the body and the need to manage, manage those and your resources. Yeah. It all goes into one bucket, you know, <laughs> ba- roughly, you know, the, 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 you know, the, our, our, our human physiology is, is from an evolutionary strand standpoint is not sophisticated and doesn't distinguish the, the stress of having bills to pay from the stress of, of a tiger chasing us from the stress of doing an interval session. So it all adds up. And, and whether you're a student athlete or a, a professional that's trying to do an age group triathlon athlete on the side, you know, you're, you're managing, you know, let's face it. We, we move this interval time because you were managing trying to get three <laughs> kids to bed. You know, if we were a big reveal for the audience, uh, guys, we're all, we're, we're trying to deal with this stuff too. And so Brad, we moved back this interview. So, because Brad's saying, I got three kids, you know, and a newborn, <laughs> one's a newborn. And so, you know, he's stressed. So, <laughs> uh, so he's, he's hiding it. He's hiding it well, but he's got stress too. And so, uh, if he's probably, I don't know if he's going to get to work out today. It's probably too late now, but point is, is that's going to impact, you know, that impacts Brad. It impacts all of us. And so, 
uh, even the world record holders, even the, the gold medalists, they still have to play that game. They still have to deal with reality. You know, mama's mama got sick or my girlfriends, you know, broke up with me or whatever. And it adds up. And so it's part of the part of life. Yeah. Looking at my notes from 2020, sustainable training is the relationship between intrinsic and extrinsic factors and not forgetting the total stress response. Uh, that was my summary from one of your modules in 2020. Talking about modules, Dr. Sila, uh, as we head uh, rapidly to the uh, upcoming live stream, uh, durability and high intensity repeatability and endurance training taking place at the time of this release in a week and a half uh, from this going live, uh, Saturday the 2nd of April, morning time in Norway, afternoon time here in Australia. There are four learning modules. One, understanding the big training picture for long-term development. Any teasers you want to throw at about that module? Well, you know, the, the big picture is just about thinking about um, – using some basic f philosophy like the 80 20 or polarize or whatever as a as guardrails as a basic structure but then being then individualizing within the guardrails just like guardrails help you go down a steep windy road you still you, you don't quit driving just because there's guardrails you still have to maneuver you still have to steer the car but they keep you from doing having a big accident they keep you from going off a cliff and then you 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 know you you negotiate through your being smart and individualizing and so forth. And that's, that's the big picture is how do we combine some basic training philosophy with some, with using our individual brains and, and cooperating with our coach to find all our optimization that, that accounts for our stress load and so forth. All right. So that's the big picture. And then we're going to go into the, a bit more of the weeds in the subsequent uh, sessions, for example, on, uh, uh, you know, those, those low intensity sessions, how do we, how do we optimize those? How do we combine duration and intensity there and so forth? Yeah. The, uh, module two, how long and how long, sorry, how low and how long for the 80% session three, module three, high intensity training sessions, intensify or extend, or maybe we should change that to extensify session four, training, <laughs> monitoring, train, eat, sleep, adjust. And of course, the ever popular Q&A. Uh, Dr. Siler, uh, thank you for priming us up for what will be a great three hours with you in a week and a half. Uh, if you're yet to register, don't miss it. If you can't make the live stream time, uh, we have a post event recording uh, for all registrants. Uh, jump over to physicalperformanceshow.com and secure your place there. But uh, any final words of wisdom, Dr. Sila? Uh, no wisdom. Just uh, I'm excited about doing the live stream. I, I, I'm stressed too because it's a lot to cover. It's a lot to talk about. Uh, so I've got to try to get, you know, make sure I'm ready and I will be. Uh, but I can't wait. Uh, and I look forward to, to tough questions, good questions. And so uh, it's always, you know, I always tell my students, don't be, there's no, there's no dumb questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. So we'll see you in, a, in what, 10 days, yeah. 10, 11 days, 10 to 11 days. Dr. Stephen Silent, thanks once again for stopping by the physical performance show. Thank you. Always a pleasure. So there you have it, a fun teaser leading into Dr. Stephen Siler's live stream event, durability and high intensity repeatability in endurance training taking place in just over a week's time on the 2nd of April, 3 to 6 p.m., Australian Eastern Standard Time. Tickets are available over at physicalperformanceshow.com. And as I mentioned, rest assured, if you are outside of that time zone, unable to make the live stream, then you will be provided with a post-event recording and, of course, a copy of the PDF presentation. So jump over to physicalperformanceshow.com. Tickets are available from $49 Australian per registrant. Now, of course, if you are a patron of the show, a supporter, you will receive complimentary access to not only this live stream, but also our back catalogue of live stream events, including 2020's highly popular live stream with Dr. Siler, Sustainable Training for Attainable Endurance Goals. If you'd like to revisit that back catalogue, it's available for purchase over at physicalperformanceshow.com. And you'll find Dr. Siler over on Twitter at Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Siler, S-E-I-L-E-R. If you're yet to follow Dr. Siler, it is a must-follow account. 
As always, a huge thank you to the team who make this show possible, Dara Misson, Audio Engineering, Matthew Olding, Graphic Design, Susan Wilkin, Show Administration. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, you are in for another scientific endurance-based treat with repeat guests of the show, Dr. Dan Plews, who will be sharing around heart rate variability. How can it help our performance, guide training, and also optimize our health? It is an expert edition not to be missed. Interestingly, Dr. Dan Plews was one of Dr. Stephen Siler's collaborators on the paper that we discussed today, the importance of durability and the physiological profiling of endurance athletes. So until next week with Dr. Dan Plews, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Listener.